Sir, thanks for joining us today on Leadership Log, which is a podcast on topics of interest to the Air Force Lifecycle Management Center community. And the topic of interest today is transporting unusual cargo. And so we've got an expert with us today. Uh, Mark Kutavanish is the chief of this office. And sir, if you could explain to us what your group is and, and what you do. Okay, uh, my group is called the uh, Air Transportability Test Loading Activity, um, or A. TTLA or ATLA, commonly referred to as ATLA. So uh, it is a response uh, office that is responsible for um, what we call certifying uh, unusual or, or problematic cargo. And uh, it is a function of uh, the uh, Air Force Life Cycle Management Center uh, Engineering Directorate um, to uh, look at cargo uh, that may cause problems while air, during airlift. And we issue a certification, which are um, instructions on how to airlift package, essentially, uh, the cargo. So it's sort of like uh, um, uh, your uh, instructions on how to get like a large grand piano into your house. You know, it may look like it fits into your house, but once you try, you know, you can't get it through the front door, you gotta remove the legs. Maybe you have to hoist it up. If you live in an apartment building, you have to hoist it up the, you know, the building and so forth. But it also includes um, how to properly uh, package the cargo to protect it from the air, uh, the flight environment, which can be uh, more severe than just driving down the road, like you're putting something in a moving van, uh, which includes extreme temperatures. Uh, vibration like air turbulence, which a lot of us have experienced, you know, in, in flying through a storm, uh, including crash. So we package the cargo so they can survive a crash and not fall apart and maybe uh, um, uh, um, fragment and then hit, you know, and kill personnel during yeah. the crash. Um, so it is a task that was, uh, um, how to say, put into a regulation back in 1978 um, by the uh, Department of Defense to say this office uh, performs this function. And the reason for that is um, when the C-5 came in the service in the late 60s, mm -hmm. uh, they were finding that people were calling the uh, Air Force Logistics Center and saying, hey, how do we move this cargo? You know, it's bigger than the C-130. Uh, we don't really know how. And they always referred back to the engineering directorate, the, uh, I think, aircraft flight equipment and parachute branch, uh, who actually, through since, um, geez, the 1930s, developed cargo delivery and parachute equipment. So we were the experts on cargo planes and parachutes. Uh, mm -hmm. We had actually been serving a similar function for airdrop since 1959, airdrop being uh, you uh, um, drop a, a piece of cargo, like a tank or a Jeep, or even people, you know, like paratroopers mm -hmm. out of the airplane uh, um, with, on parachutes. So that was a natural evolution. And, and the reason, uh, and so uh, the engineering directorate or EN proposed to Air Force Systems Command, uh, now AFMC, um, yeah, AFMC, Air Force Material Command, um, that, hey, you know what, why don't you just uh, make it, create an office to do this in EN uh, and, and uh, um, from a, uh, how do you say, policy point of view, EN is an independent engineering organization. So we are not influenced by factors like if you're in a uh, um, air mobility command, for example, and be pressured into approving something or mobility directorate or an aircraft, you know, systems program office. So we're, we, we look at things independently. So that was the benefit of, of uh, putting this function uh, into this office. Okay. So, uh, uh, so if you could tell us a little bit about, um, about your career, your background, and also mm -hmm. the, your team. Um, how mm -hmm. big is the team? What kind, of, what kind of specialties, what kind of trades are they? Okay. So uh, I've been in this business for 37 years. I've worked in the US government as an engineer uh, for 41 years. 
So I came to write Pat in, in late uh, 1987 into the office. I had been a parachute expert prior at a U.S. Army research lab in Boston. Um, so it was a natural fit. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been supported and worked in the C-17 uh, Systems Program Office, or SPO, uh, um, twice. One as a cargo delivery expert and, uh, and a structures expert later on in the 2000s. And I uh, was the chief systems engineer on C-27J. But I've also supported all the cargo aircraft offices uh, at, at the, or the SPOs uh, uh, throughout the years. So C-130J, um, you know, C-5, C-141s, and, and, and so forth. Um, so, and then uh, uh, in 2012, I became the boss of the office. Mm -hmm. And then my team uh, um, consists of very, uh, the number varies through the years. Uh, we used to be a separate branch. And during the uh, downsizing in 1992, the office was combined with the crew systems branch. Uh, so we're like a sub team of, of a branch. Um, and uh, um, it, it has been as low as two people. And now we're up to nine, including myself. Um, so the uh, people uh, can include, uh, um, let's see, um, three um, former load masters or, uh, you know, technicians as their as their civilian now they were former military load masters and a load master is the person responsible for the car compartment inside the aircraft so he's an air crew member he flies yeah. with the load he configures the load make sure it's you know restrained safely and loaded unloaded safely um, so we hired you know retired load masters and we also have one active load master who's uh, um, an air AMC or Air Mobility Command uh, load master who is loaned off to AFMC. So he's okay. an AFMC command load master. Uh, and then we have two uh, airdrop specialists who are uh, also experts in air transport, but they focus more on airdrop. So they know more about parachutes and, and things like that. And then uh, the rest of the team consists of uh, mostly mechanical, one aerospace and a couple of mechanical engineers. Um, okay. So that's, that's it. Yeah. There, there's no, like, you don't learn this in school. So, yeah. you know, we, <laughs> we are aerospace or usually mechanical engineers. So, um, so it's, it's, it's clearly an, an important thing because I mean, we need to protect personnel. We need to protect the aircraft. We need to protect the cargo that we're transporting. Um, I, I've heard it referred to as like problematic cargo. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what is that? Give us some examples to help us understand what that really kind of entails. Okay, but there's your definition in the regulations. Uh, so there's a uh, overall uh, um, DOD instruction, DODI, which is like the top level uh, um, regulation that says our office, you know, is selected by the Secretary of the Air Force to do this job. And it defines what a, uh, a problematic cargo is. And that flowed down to MIL standard 1791, which is, um, design of cargo. So these are rules. Uh, uh, it's like a housing, how, you know, how to build a house code, yeah. uh, book of codes. So uh, a problematic cargo uh, also allows us to screen cargo. So it essentially says if your size is bigger than 20 feet by eight feet wide by nine feet high, um, you know, heavier than 10,000 pounds, uh, have, uh, let's say if it's on wheels, have the, uh, you know, wheel weight greater than such pounds. But if you're a, you're transporting a boat, um, let's see, uh, anything that carries a liquid like a fuel tank, like you see on the road, uh, <clears throat> or if it uh, operates like electrical power inside the aircraft, um, or requires um, special procedures to fly this thing, to load and unload this thing or fly it, then we should evaluate it. So that's in the prop, what we call problematic cargo. Um, so we don't have to look at everything like, you know, a bread box, you know, versus right. like a tank. Mm -hmm. So it, it, there's a clear definition. So now on some, on some items, do you, uh, do you assess it once and then establish like a standard and say, okay, on 
this is a this is um, any similar item or you know like a like a Humvee. If you're going to transport a hum Humvee, you would have a mm -hmm. standard on how that was going to be done, and then that would always so you wouldn't have to check it every single time. Um, we tried to do that. Um, okay. it, uh, for example, with a Humvee, it turns out you know uh, we what we do is we look at something like. Uh, what is the ultimate capability? How much weight can a Humvee carry? Because a Humvee has different models and versions where they attach different things. Like uh, one Humvee may have a, a cab cover uh, where, you know, uh, like on a truck. Uh, mm -hmm. Another Humvee may have a gun mounted on top. Some have, you know, like uh, um, anti-aircraft missiles mounted on them. And some even have small rooms, control rooms mounted on what we call shelters mounted on them. So what we do is first we look at the chassis and the Humvee and the suspension and axles and say, OK, you cannot carry more than, say, you know, 15,000 pounds on this Humvee. And uh, um, every other one, as these models come in, um, we, we, we add to the certification to say, okay, all these models are approved, but they all have the same limits. So right. we do try to uh, say, make it as generic as possible. Okay. But now if somebody comes to you with, a, with an unusual item, a one of, mm -hmm. one of a kind kind of thing, um, mm -hmm. how, how do they contact you? And what, what process do they follow in order to get you guys to do your, um, your evaluation of? Okay, well, we, we try to make it as easy as possible. Uh, first of all, we can only accept what we call government sponsored projects. But that that but but that's that's every anyone who works in the government. So it can be uh, what we call aerial porters, you know, the uh, um, military people who work on at the airport, uh, uh, say a cargo receiving terminal, mm -hmm. you know, somebody shows up with a load, they can contact us or a program manager from say, like the Humvee office, um, or somebody who works for NASA, or, you know, uh, um, some other, uh, how do you say, Department of Agriculture or FEMA. So they, they basically email us at atla at us.af.mil. Mm -hmm. um, and that's referred to on the charts. Um, <clears throat> and basically make an email request. You don't have to write a letter. You don't have to, uh, um, uh, you know, put it into a request, special request form or anything like that. So mm -hmm. it is, uh, and that's our, you know, that's document. You, you are free to do that. Sometimes uh, um, program offices or contracts require formal request, you know, and they would okay. send a memo in and so forth. But very easy. And then uh, uh, we also have a, uh, a SharePoint site. Okay. Um, and you, we have that, on, I have that on the charts. You can display okay. um, Intel, something or other. So all you need is a common access card. So a DOD common access card to access it. So you don't have to, in previous years, we, we've uh, um, uh, had to create a membership list and then they have to fill out a security form and all that. Well, if you have a common access card, that's already taken care of, so no duplication yeah. of effort. And on that SharePoint site contains all your design requirements, the mill standards and, and so forth, uh, plus a list of cargo that have already been certified. So we have, you know, uh, approximately, geez, almost 9,000, you know, yeah, uh, more than between eight and 9,000 and growing number of cargo we've certified since um, the mid 70s mm -hmm. um, and so you can pull those records up and uh, um, you don't need to come back to us so it's a self-help 24-hour uh, uh, SharePoint that is uh, I think at one time we did a survey back in about 2014 um, that it was like the third busiest site yeah. Uh, you know, personnel, military personnel sites are much bit busier, busier, you know, a lot of traffic there, but mm -hmm. we average about well, over 200,000 hits a year. Wow. Yeah. And 24 seven. So there's no yep. interruption in business uh, because we're nine to five office weekdays uh, for emergencies. We do monitor email on weekends. Okay. So we do have had some weekend, you know, like Friday night 
yeah you know saturday uh, uh um, requests um let's see what else we can include here um but any communication uh, so so what happens is you you submit a project uh um i'll assign it or the chief will assign it to an engineer they can't mm -hmm. work uh, with with the person with the uh, uh, with the group, and then uh, um, uh, as far as data goes, we we uh, um, normally give an average of about 45, 60 days after all the data is received. Okay, <clears throat> and mm -hmm. but we can work interactively. Um, so you you uh, um, you can say submit. You know you, you get this data. You don't have to wait for all the data to come in, and uh, the data and we have a data sheet. So mm -hmm. you have a list of things to submit to us, you know, yep. with illustrations and instructions. So we try to make it as user friendly uh, as possible. And then at the end, um, you receive what we call a certification. Uh, sometimes your crew members are allowed to uh, 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 refer to it as an ATLA, you know, um, okay. but it's a certification with the list of item name, nomenclatures, a, a, a photo, instructions, uh, um, limitations, and so forth. Uh, uh, and then th that's given back to the program office or the customer. And also copies go to Air Mobility Command uh, because they, they are the ones who fly the cargo yeah. plus the transportation agencies. So, uh, uh, and our SharePoint. So there are multiple records of these and they, they are not time sensitive. They last forever. Okay. They can be modified as changes are made to the item, you know. So uh, if any if any changes to the item that affects your transportability, we will reevaluate. But if you say uh, change the color, or let's say you put in a new electronic box internally that don't that doesn't affect their transportability, right. you don't need to revise, you know, the certification. Mm -hmm. So is um, this uh, just for Air Force aircraft, or are the other services? Uh, involved as well. Yeah, so uh, our responsibility uh, and, you know, the, the, and the Air Force has to follow our certification uh, that's in their regulations. Um, uh, yeah, our responsibility only covers Air Force aircraft. Okay. We do not cover, um, however, the Air Force uh, Air Mobility Command does lease out uh, the civil fleet or CRAF, C-R-A-F, Civil Reserve mm -hmm. Fleet. So they can go to their company like Airborne Express and say, we like to lease your 747s to move cargo. Or you see in a lot of times, troop movements, you know, they use a commercial aircraft airliner. So we used to certify cargo for those aircraft, but we found that, um, you know, the, the companies uh, create too many variations within their cargo fleet that we cannot track them. You know, they have little limitations, different okay. uh, um, cargo loading manuals. So mm -hmm. we've decided that leave it up to the company to certify the loads themselves. Okay. Um, Trying to think, but as far as, for example, the Navy who have C-130s um, grandfather our certifications. So they do accept our certifications. Um, our, our responsibility or authority also covers smaller aircraft, too. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of, of something like the C-208. Okay. <clears throat> you know, uh, um, something, you, you it only sits like a dozen passengers. Right. And they can carry small boxes. Sometimes they, we, they ask us, you know, about interesting small weapon systems. You know, including air dropping from them. Um, so, so the uh, like Af uh, Air Force uh, Special Operations Command aircraft, we have authority over. Um, we work a lot with foreign countries, and they buy or lease our C-130s and our C-17s. So they take our certifications. Um, and they have their own organizations, most of them. Um, actually, Canada pays us to certify cargo for their C-17s, mm -hmm. um, but other countries, they take ours as a recommendation because sometimes they have different operating procedures. So they would basically take the essential data from our certifications and then modify them accordingly you know, for, for their use. 
Um, we also fly foreign owned uh, weapon systems or cargo. Uh, and so if they are HEP certified it for their fleet, uh, we also take their certifications as a recommendation and then adjust it to our, you know, unique way of doing things. Yep. Uh, we are working with the uh, um, foreign allies to streamline the process. So, because we can't, we, you know, uh, um, sometimes you work with say restricted information type cargo. Uh, we can't share, we can't readily share and say, hey, come to our SharePoint, you know? Yeah. So right. we're trying to figure that out with the foreign countries. Uh, we, we've, uh, uh, we are, how do you say, uh, a, a bit unique. A lot of foreign countries only de uh, develop uh, um, cargo that's only designed for airlift or for their aircraft. Whereas we airlift anything, you know, military mm -hmm. equipment to uh, commercial off the shelf, uh, mostly commercial off the shelf. So, okay. yeah, so we're more versatile. Um, so, sir, if you could tell us a few of the success stories you've had, say, in the last year. And um, mm -hmm. I mean, did, did COVID impact? I'm sure it did impact your workload or? Yeah, interestingly enough, um, we were set up. Uh, back in 2012, uh, when President Obama uh, um, created the uh, um, timeline for uh, uh, reduce, uh, um, you know, uh, how do you say, uh, what we call the retrograde from Afghanistan, the withdrawal of mm -hmm. the majority of the troops uh, from Afghanistan. So that was about a um, four year, almost four, four year project. Uh, um, so we went from like certifying about a couple hundred loads a year to up to like 550 items a year. Um, and so Air Mobility Command wanted us to go 24 seven, but we only had nine people in the office. We compromised on getting laptops and a, and a Blackberry and um, for emergencies. So we were pretty mobile. So when, when we went to quarantine, you know, that didn't affect us. Right. really at all. We were used to working remotely, working on weekends. Uh, but the interesting part was we were tasked to uh, help develop and certify uh, two uh, types of uh, um, what we call transport, people transport modules to uh, transport uh, people with COVID from overseas yep. and called uh, um, NPC and NPCL or neg negatively pressurized connects. NPC and mm -hmm. the light version for a smaller one for C-130s. So I was involved, I, uh, I was and, and two other uh, engineers and our load master were involved with that. And that was a 90 day project to develop it from scratch, define the specs, issue an RFP, go on contract, qualify it within 90 and build, you mm -hmm. know, like a dozen of them within 90 days. So that, uh, um, was a almost a I'd say on average we worked about 18 to 20 hours a day wow. for about three quarters of the time online you know and when and the difficulty I think we experienced mainly was at the beginning when we didn't we had a shortage you know of the network system mm -hmm. so that kind of slowed things down a bit um, we do use some tools like AutoCAD which is a drawing tool we can use to simulate uh, um, cargo loading, you know, and that ties into the high-speed computing system, you know, but again, mm -hmm. we can access it through our laptop. So, okay. um, you know, just mainly relocation and we weren't together with us so we can shout across the cubicle about something, but we, we adapted pretty well, you know, and, yeah. and so it was less impact than a lot of other, you know, people. All so right. we didn't delay our work much. Yeah. What What are some other uh, big achievements in the last year? Okay. Well, one of the big highlights is uh, um, we we had to work with uh, Robbins Air Force Base uh, um, and develop a new cargo pallet. And a cargo pallet is uh, like a big plate that you carry cargo on, and it uh, rolls in and out of the cargo aircraft and locks into <laughs> the aircraft rail system or logistic pallet as they call mm -hmm. it. Uh, so we were involved in actually developing the first one 
uh, um, and uh, became operational. Uh, it's called the 4630 pallet, uh, and it was operational in 1963. That's part of the name. And uh, millions of them have been used and purchased uh, through the inventory. However, wear and tear and cost of maintenance uh, was sufficiently bad enough that, um, you know, the Air Force was uh, developed a, a replacement. So we finally certified the replacement after operational testing uh, earlier this year. So mm-hmm. now it will, re- it is more about 10 times uh, um, stronger, a lot more durable you know, all aluminum. Uh, um, And uh, um, think about comparable weight. So uh, um, that's the new pallet. So we're going to basically remove the old pallet by attrition. We're not Mm going to repair them and just replace them with the new one. Okay. Uh, So that was pretty exciting. So we were involved in, you know, from the ground floor. Um, Let me add something. And this is Mm -hmm. a part of our, uh, you know, when you say contact Adla, is we can work with you from the beginning, from concept, uh, the, the earlier, the better. So we can yeah. help you design something to make it easier to airlift. Um, I've got a chart, uh, a display of uh, uh, moving this rock crusher, right? Uh, so one of the problems with getting in and out of the uh, airplane, you may require special loading ramps because you could try to load it in, sometimes it might hit part of the airplane or scrape the ground. You know, we don't want mm-hmm. to damage the load. So um, typically you build special ro- loading ramps out of wood or plywood and then uh, um, lo- make it easier to load up. But, but complicated items may require a large quantity of, uh, you know, construction, time of construction material. The example I, I, I showed you required um, 78,000 pounds of lumber mm-hmm. to load this thing. And then you have to fly with it to wow. unload it on the other side. <laughs> you know, so you have <laughs> to figure out where am I going to put this in the airplane? You know, this big item you have, I have yeah. fills the airplane anyway. Now I need a second airplane to carry this thing to unload it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, um, you know, the, that's one of the issues. The, that's one of the benefits. We try to minimize yeah. that effort. Um Going back to another successful load, uh, let's see, it is a, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember from the chart now because I can't see it. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, let's see, oh, I know, there, there's a, what we call a T-wall or Alaskan barrier. So it is a protective concrete wall, about you know, 11, 12 feet high. Uh, um, so we transported from Afghanistan uh, um, I think it was protecting the green zone and they brought it back to the Air Force Museum as a memorial mm-hmm. and the, this wall section, the, I think there were three wall sections and they weighed between 16,000 to 18,000 pounds each. Wow. Yeah. So that was, uh, you know, trying to, but they were not that long, you know, so there's a very highly concentrated weight. To put on mm-hmm. the air. So we have to figure out how to spread that weight to make sure we don't uh, damage the aircraft. Um, let's see, another one was um, uh, a mobile oil refinery. So it's a mini uh, um, oil refinery. Uh, um, U.S. SOCOM or Special Operations Command uh, developed. And we have, uh, you can fly any, you know, any place in the world put it together and start refining oil. Wow. And that uh, um, took three, we helped them shrink it down and package it so that to minimize the number of aircraft. But even so, it took three C-5 aircraft to, to do carry this. The whole thing. Yeah. Um, one interesting project that I think is, uh, you know, sort of relevant uh, um pretty soon is the James Webb telescope container. Uh, that was actually developed and, and test loaded back in 2016 or 17 here at Wright-Patterson. Mm-hmm. And basically it was used to take parts of the telescope. They have uh, this, each section of the telescope is built in different parts of the country, like five different places. So this container is supposed to carry the sections to the next site 
they piece it together, put it back in the container, take it to the next site, and so forth. And it, it, and it was, you know, one of the biggest loads we've ever put into the C5. Uh, and it's going to plan to be launched on December 22nd of this year. So that's kind of neat. Mm -hmm. um, we actually uh, worked on transporting the, the Hubble telescope back in the late 80s. Um, uh -huh. And that took, because it was so big, it took nine hours to load on a C5. Wow. Uh, because... Um, it was so tight, we had to wait for the C5 to be at the right temperature. You inch it up, let the airplane settle, inch it up again. So it took nine mm -hmm. hours to load. You wow. Know. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and it was so sensitive, it was designed to take uh, three major forces, take off and landing from the C5 and launch. Mm. Wow. So, yeah, so we, we have uh, been involved in, you know, very unusual type of cargo from live animals to, uh, um, you know, weapon systems like tanks. Um, okay. So it makes the job very interesting. Uh, I personally uh, was a project engineer for transporting Keiko, the free willy whale, back in 1998. So oh, I really, really freed willy. Yeah, carried <laughs> it from <laughs> an aquarium in Oregon to a little island in uh, Iceland, Vestman Island, that's... Mm -hmm. Five miles long, three miles wide, and you know a very small airport on a C-17. Um, so uh, that was uh, my 15 minutes of fame. <laughs> so it's almost like uh, in Star Trek: The Voyage Home, where they transported the whales, right? It, practically, yes. <laughs> we didn't have a see-through tank, but uh, okay. the tank itself was, uh, um, you know, a little over 30 feet long. Uh, mm -hmm. With the whale, the whale was about 30 feet long. Um, and weighed almost 9,000 pounds. Wow. And we had water with him, you know, and so the whole thing with him in it weighed, uh, um, you know, almost 60,000 pounds loaded. And then we added water to make him more comfortable during flight. Mm -hmm. uh, so he weighed probably 80 some thousand pounds, you know, the whole thing. Um, plus we carried a boat. <laughs> Uh, scientists and observation gear and food supplies, everything, because the C-17 is the only aircraft in the world that could do, can land on this small island carrying everything. Oh, okay. Um, All right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's quite a challenge, but, but uh, when we first got the project, those were the, the I heard a lot of Star Trek jokes <laughs> and what would you do with the dead whale jokes? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I remember so, there are a couple uh, of other examples. But uh, sure. um, there, but I don't quite recall from my my. Mm -hmm. I can't see my briefing chart. Um, well, well uh, that that pretty much brings us to the end of our time. Anyhow, um, uh, let me just ask again if, if if there's anything that I forgot to ask you about, and and mm -hmm. also if you could repeat again uh, how it is best to contact Adla. Okay, um, so uh, and you can you can you know display this. Uh, um, as well. I have mm -hmm. that on the, on the briefing chart. So uh, um, you would email to attla at us.af.mil. And that's our office inbox uh, okay. so that we have an engineer uh, who mans that each week. You know, that is their job each week. So we rotate people doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and uh, so they ha they can answer like, you know, uh, uh, easy questions or they can start a project, um, you know, or, or uh, um, you know, uh, how do you say, uh, just make cut like customer support. Yeah. Um, so that's the best way to contact us. Um, the phone number, I'm not sure yet because it's my phone number. Yeah, it's always been we the Atlas phone number, but. You know, I'm yeah, going to we'll, retire. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. So you mentioned earlier in, that you're going to retire at the end of this year. So, uh, uh, so I, I think in closing, let's let's say congratulations to you on that and for everything that you've done for the Air Force and for Atla all these years in, in, of your service. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Um, oh, let me add this: um, mm -hmm. if you are designing cargo. Um, you should refer to MIL standard 1791 that's designed for air transportability. And if you're doing airdrop, um, you refer to MIL standard 1791-1, uh, 
okay. for airdrop. Now the 1791 uh, designed for air transportability is a distribution, a public releasable document. Uh, and we did that so that you can download it off the internet. Uh, it has design requirements and interface data on all the cargo planes, because you know you load a C5 differently than a C130, for example. Mm -hmm. And it allows contractors to bid on, you know, uh, um, cargo. You allow foreign countries say they're developing weapon system, but they want like a NATO country. Right. Right. And they want to, you know, have the U.S. transport it. They can build it so it's easy to transport. You know, okay. a lot of benefits there. Or yeah. National Science Foundation, you know, things like the, uh, NASA. So mm -hmm. uh, that's the benefit of, of having this. Uh, we're working on the airdrop to open that up too. But right now, it's. Uh, but but anyway, the, to, in summary, you should it, it, you should contact Atla at us.af.mil. All right. Sir, thanks for again for uh, helping us understand better about transporting problematic cargo. Well, uh, um, my pleasure, and uh, I hope you have you know good material to work with. <laughs>